the gospel. You, you just sang the gospel this morning. That God came after sinners. Does that story ever get old? Come on, really, does it ever get old? Like, I think the church could spend its life preaching one sermon. <laughs> never change the subject, never go anywhere else. Just, just preach that truth, that God saves sinners. And the gospel is our good news. And, and the good news is that in Christ, that's Paul's point in Ephesians, that you and I are not condemned anymore, although we deserve it. So this is how Paul describes it. I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell you the bad news. <laughs> and then they're going to really celebrate why it's good news. Because Paul says of our condition, and by the way, I, you can follow if you want to. I'm in Ephesians 2, but my assumption is since we've studied this, um, we're just going to hear it again. So I'd like you just to lean in and look at me and listen and absorb again. Maybe hear something fresh for the first time. Ephesians 2, Paul said it is bad as it is, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in, once you, in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now in the work of the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. If that's all you ever knew, if that's the only truth you ever heard, you're, you're begging uncle at this point. Dead. That's how he starts out the description of the problem. Uh, deadness has to do with uh, a condition of the heart. The heart can't produce living acts. It can't produce faith. It can't produce affections for God. It can't produce obedience. The heart is dead. It's unresponsive. It's it just dormant. It is also a description of a lifestyle. Therefore, because my heart is dead, guess what I do? I can only do dead things. And clearly, dead is a description of a consequence, isn't it? Because the scripture says the wrath of God remains on those who are dead, and future deadness is eternity separated from God in a place called hell. All of it's bad, bad news. As bad as it could possibly be. And Paul goes on to say, and by the way, it so affects you, your ears can only hear the wrong audience. You perceive the world, you hear the voice of the adversary, and you kind of follow the ways of the world. You're, you're drawn to the wrong voice. Unable to control our shameful, self-harming impulses. That is the terrible condition that we've learned in Ephesians and other places that Paul says we have a problem with. And who can argue, right? I've never met the person who sits there and argues against that description. This last week, I had uh, not the privilege, but the responsibility to go home for a funeral. My nephew died. Still don't know why, 23 years old. But, but because of my brother's relationship with all of my past relationships at the, at the funeral and at the, the visitation, I saw lots of people that go back decades, like decades, three plus decades. And after talking to them, I realized something in my chats with them. Everyone's dysfunctional. <laughs> and what I also realized is that nobody knows it. I was very disappointed, you know. Um, but then it dawned on me as I was leaving uh, the funeral, I go, if they're all dysfunctional and they don't know it, well, then I must be, and I don't know it. And maybe that's a cute way to remind us of Paul's point, I think Paul's main point in Romans 2, before he tells us the good news, is that every one of us have issues. They might not be the same, but they're s serious issues. There's an unforgiveness in our hearts. There's a, a discouragement in our hearts. There is insecurities in our hearts. There are addictions in our hearts. There's tendencies and failures and scars. Every person I've ever met has them. And if you're not lucky enough to be born with self-awareness, then you just walk around thinking it's everybody else's problem. But therein lies somewhat of a narrative of how dark the deadness can be. And why we need somebody to respond to that bad news with the greatest news ever given. And that is that Jesus comes after people like that. He really does. And he rescues people like that. That is the solution. And may I suggest to you the beginning of verse 4, in two words, is the shortest, most concise depiction of the good news anybody's ever heard. After Paul gets done talking about how bad it is, he says, but God... Which, to be honest with you, is the only thing you can say. God has to do something. And God did everything. But God, those would all be true. They'd all be accusations. They'd all be feelings. They'd be my reality. And they'd be my future. But God. God rescued. 
Listen, if, you, uh, if all you ever heard was how Paul describes the problem, and, it, and if all you ever did was evaluate yourself honestly, if you were one of those people who could actually see your, con- your concerns and issues, at this point in the narrative, you're begging for help. It, you're asking God to do something for your brokenness. And here's the thing. God knows you need help. And he knew it way before you ever did. Way before someone told you about deadness, way before you got old enough to have so many scars you don't know what to do with, way before that, God knew that you and I needed help. And in his sovereign plan, and in his sovereign purpose, before he set the foundations of the universe in place, he set his affections on you. That's what Paul said. Before you ever figured it out, before you were, he loved. Now, I don't have time to to go in detail about some of the specificness of the phrases Paul's used, but I think it would be interesting just to look at these phrases because they're magnificent. In his response to the bad news, when he tells us what God did, when he fills in the blanks, but God, this is the phrases he uses. His response to this concern is to be rich in mercy, to be great in love, to offer a saving grace and a free gift of faith. That is that is. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. That's God's response to that. And if you're like me at this point, you're saying, well, how, how can that be possible? How can he just offer free gift of grace? How can he offer saving faith? How can he do those things? Well, that's the phrase that Paul says more than anything else in the entire book of Ephesians. In Christ. In Christ. Do you remember? That, that is the overwhelming reason for all things when Paul gets to the bottom of it. In Christ, verse five, in Christ, he made us alive together with Christ. With Christ, he's raised us with him. Verse six, we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Verse seven, that we might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us in Christ. You want me to paraphrase this for you? Christ is the good news. Salvation can be seen as somewhat of a, self-centered, myopic look, like I get out of my problems, I get something I want. That's not the point of even of the gospel. Jesus is the good news. The creator, maker, sustainer of your life wants to get close to you. And he wants to deal with all those issues of deadness. It is Christ's mercy and his great love and his saving grace and it's his gift of faith. The gospel is Jesus for sinners and nothing else. I know many of us have been at funerals, but people say the weirdest thing at funerals. And it was no different at my nephew's. I don't know very many people in that room, but I saw some of his friends. One of his friends stood up and said, uh, uh, it's so good that Jake is with us today. Jake was my nephew's name. And he's all around us, and he's always with us, helping us to live our lives. And I thought when he said it, well, man, Jake sounds a lot like Jesus. Of course, none of that's true. Our dead loved ones aren't all around us helping us live our life. They don't watch over us. They don't do that. They are not God. Jesus is, however. I found it very interesting that what was bringing this boy comfort at this time was the thought that someone could. And here's what we've said in this wonderful narrative of Ephesians. Someone did, and his name is Jesus. The hero of Ephesians is Jesus. The hero of your story is Jesus. The hero of all life is Jesus, amen? That's what moves our soul. The good news is that we are saved by the great mercy and love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And he comes to sinners who offer nothing to him, who have nothing to bring to the table. Only Jesus brings everything to the table, doesn't he? And if we use the analogy of what, what he described to his disciples, he brings his body and his blood to the table. Which, which is why we're going to take communion together this morning, and we do it every week, is we're to remind ourselves that Jesus brought everything to the table. He took a common loaf of bread and he said, eat this, and let it remind you forever that my body is being broken for you. Now, I'm certain they knew very little of what he was talking about, but we know very much. Pulverized body of the Lord Jesus the maker of all things, intentionally come to rescue us from our deadness. And that cup, that cup that represents this this new grace, this new relationship of, of faith in his work and freedom 
And we eat and drink to remember, don't we? So here's what I want to do this morning. I want the ushers to come and serve you. And I, I want to take it together. So when they serve you, hold the elements carefully. And then as soon as everyone's served, then we'll eat and drink together, okay? Let's do that. As I told you, uh, one of the things that moved me in my study, in our study of the book of Ephesians, is how Paul in his wonderful telling of the gospel had all these so what's to it. And one of the pr- prominent so what's hanging out in the center is, is what God does to people and how he unites people together. And I think that's one of his main focuses in this, and that is that God through Christ has broken down the walls, as Paul's words, the walls of hostility and division that exist between people groups. And what God has done in his wonderful gospel is formed one new man, one new people, um, all that are designed to worship God and grow together. You remember this, right? How many of you remember us going through this section together? Okay. I couldn't escape in my study now this last year how profound it was that we'd be in this book uh, dealing with this particular subject matter as a reflection of this good news of God saving sinners in a time and a culture that we live in. It seems to me that uh, one of the best ways to describe what it is to be dead in sin is just to look for the division. It could be something as obvious and painful as racial division, but it's clearly bigger than that. It's political divisions, it's gender divisions, and they just keep inventing them daily. We've got to decide which camp we're in and how to be divided. That's not what the gospel does to people. Now, it dawned on me that you would think after thousands of years of improvement, I say that word loosely, of learning and of making laws and having movements um, that we'd be over some of this stuff, or, or at least better. But in my humble opinion, it feels like it's more intense than it's been in a long, long time. Um, and it feels sort of like land that we've sort of gained is now slipping through our hands all over again. And I concluded, and I think we concluded together, and that's because laws and movements don't change the heart of man. Jesus does. You you can have moments in time, and and things might perceive to be better, but what the world needs to overcome all the hatred and distance we have towards each other is the love of Christ, amen? And that's that's the... amazing part of the reflection of Paul in this gospel story is what God has done to make us new and to make us one. It's the love of Christ poured out on dead and blind people that make them brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's what it takes. Who, by the way, become absolutely essential to each other's growth. That's how he describes it. And uh, I'm not certain that gets enough press, but at least we've tried to press into that and say this is where we belong. This is how we fit in this wonderful grand narrative is that God has put us in context with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ to see about each other, to be a brother and sister's keeper, to help each other grow up into Christ. And for, let me just remind you of a couple things Paul said in Ephesians 2, uh, this wonderful beginning about what, what the world, what sin is separate, God is bringing back together. And he talks about the Gentiles in their flesh versus the Jews. And he says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were once separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants and promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was your plight. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off but have been brought near. And he himself is our peace who's made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility and abolished, abolishing the laws and commandments expressing in ordinances that he might reconcile us both to God in one body. And he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. And for through him we both have access to one spirit. It's interesting, he goes on to say, in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God. He added to the idea and the understanding and the depth of what God does to make us one in chapter four where he says, and this is amazing, that in order to, to see this come to fruition, God has equipped the church with, he says, saints for the work of the ministry. We, we're, we're talking about evangelists and prophets and apostles and teachers to, to equip us to do the very thing that God has called us to do until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And then he kind of finishes that paragraph with his amazing truth. That in Christ, 
the whole body being held and joined together, every joint in which it's equipped, when each part is walk, working properly, makes the body grow up into maturity. In Paul's mind and in Christ's mind, having us saved and together is the only way this side of heaven we become like Christ. We need each other. He made the point in, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 where he talks about this body analogy and says, okay, everyone has a different role to play. Like a body has different parts. A foot can't say to the hand it has no value or the eye to the foot that it has no value. Everything plays an important part. And without those parts, it falls apart. And he uses that analogy to describe how we work together. We're not all the same. We don't have the same gifts, but God in his wisdom has put us together to fulfill the calling, to to fulfill the mission, and to see about each other's growth. And it isn't a little bit of business. It's a huge grand business. And by the way, when we talk about that narrative, nothing could be further from the Americana version of church than anything I know. Because what we think of church is it's somewhere I go when it's convenient, not someplace that my growth and my wisdom and my maturity is dependent upon. I'm not trying to be critical of everyone. I'm just saying, generally speaking, our culture has done that to that word, right? Just kind of checked it off as something to do. A tradition, a culture. One of the things that was obvious to me going back home and seeing all these people that are decades old in my life is where are you now? Because I all knew them in one church. (laughs) They're not there. They're scattered to the wind, which is classically American too. We're brothers and sisters until if it gets a little uncomfortable, if it gets a little warm, a little unnecessary, I'm out of here. I'll find the next one. And I, I think therein lies a challenge for us. Okay? We have uh, redefined church, as it were. But what Paul has told us, what is clear from his so what to this good news, is that God has designed us to be together. We are brothers and sisters. And, and by the way, another analogy. I have five brothers and sisters. And, and I don't see them very often at all. And, and, and I sat with them this week. I go, man, this would be hard. It'd be hard. And they're my flesh. And I understand how the analogy then goes to people who aren't flesh and blood. And it becomes even maybe more hard. But it's still equally true that God has designed us to belong to each other. And he's designed us that our growth would depend on each other. And that's Paul's point. In Ephesians 4, you can't grow alone. Now, I, I know this might not always be true, but cut me some slack here. My, my experience tells me that it's mostly true. Just find me someone who is struggling with sin, who's struggling with doubt, discouragement, and I will find you someone who isn't connected to a group of believers. I think it's mostly true. When darkness falls on the heart of man, he's typically alone. And somehow God knew that, and somehow God said, I'm going to provide for you. Guess what it's going to be? (laughs) This messy thing. Us. You'll be here when I need you, or when you need me, and vice versa. It'll be both directions. And so, Paul says, the whole body makes the body grow when each part's working properly. So, because I'm a practical guy, let me talk about that and try to be as blunt as I can. If God has designed us to be a one people, a people of of ministers who minister to each other out of the particular gifts that God has given us for everyone's growth and maturity, if that's how God designed it, um, then don't you think it'd be reasonable enough to think that there'd be exponential dysfunction in our lives if we neglected it? Come on, don't you think so? Of course there would be. Do you think our counseling rooms would be filled with marriages that are falling apart because they've neglected the one another's? High potential. Do you think people who are dealing with fear and loneliness and addictions are in their loneliness dealing with those things and not in the sense of the other people in the church? I I can't. Can I just suggest to you for a second that it's impossible to predict the effect of neglecting something? You can't. I suppose if you're honest, you can stop and go, I am neglecting it, and so therefore it is what it is, but I think I'm okay, you know? Those of us who are getting older who don't exercise, you know, I wake up and I feel okay. I can still touch my toes. Everything's okay. It's impossible to predict what neglecting your body will produce. You don't know. It could just happen. 
It could just happen. You just wake up and have a heart attack. And, and they will tell you, hey, because you had so much plaque in your heart, because you never moved, because those things are the reasons why. You don't count that. And you have no way to count when you neglect the body. It's kind of like an accident waiting to happen. I'm okay. I'm doing all right. I'm still married. Still got a job. I'm all right. Are you really? And are you prepared for the onslaught? of the evil one who wants to sift you. And God has said, I put you in the context of the one another's so that you can grow together, not without suffering, not in total peace and harmony, but in the tension of the one another's so that you can be strong until the day of the Lord Jesus. That's how the body is supposed to function. And some of us neglect that. Um, so, um, listen, it is not complicated how to do this thing. It might be a little costly, but it's not complicated. When I tell you from time to time that I love you. Do you believe me? I know, I'm a, I, I know I got issues, but trust me. I don't say things unless I mean them. I might be difficult, but I, I do love you. And I can see how you love each other. Uh, there is some work we could do in this department. Would you agree? So I'm going to try something right now. I'm going to see if you got the guts for it. Uh, there's a thing we do every week and it's so automatic, I know you don't even think about it. We, we stand at a particular part in our service and why don't you just say hi to a neighbor and tell them you're glad to see him here today. And then about 10 seconds later, you've done whatever you gotta do, you've tagged up and you're back in your seat looking forward, right? I wanna stretch it. So, so what I'm gonna do is give you some uh, tools. We're gonna take four minutes and I've got a stop clock so you don't have to feel like this is gonna go on forever. We're gonna turn on some music and you're gonna stand up and 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 try to just to meet people you don't know and ask them very common questions. This one and other things starts with knowledge. Knowledge starts with relationship. Relationship takes a little bit of effort. So let's practice, yeah? Come on, I know you're uncomfortable. And it's okay. If you're one of those who freak out on this thing, just sit there with your head down, act like you're praying. The, the rest of us... The rest of us are gonna try to move a little bit. You know, not much, but feel free. Four minutes, ready? Here are the questions. Pretty simple. Pretty simple, right? You guys ready? Please stand. Let's go. Four minutes. It seems to me um, that we should finish with one major theme in Paul's instructions to the church in Ephesus. And that is uh, the growing change that God brings to his people. The certain change, the transformative change that he brings into the lives of his people. We have, when we looked at the first three chapters and Paul starts about uh, this every spiritual blessing that is ours in Christ Jesus and then he goes in detail for three chapters to talk about what that means. That you and I are elected in God's sovereign plan that it is a work of grace alone. The power of God poured out on our lives. When you're all said and done with that, it has to, has to do more than just get us from hell to heaven, Right? And I think that's why Paul goes there. He says in chapter four, verse one, therefore, therefore walk in a manner worthy of that calling. This amazing sovereign calling. Paul's understanding of salvation was this. It always equals transformation. Always. Not perfection. Not until glory. And certainly not immediate because it's over your entire lifetime. And it is not easy because of all the language that Paul uses to describe what it is to walk in new life. He talks about it in the sense that it's a fight. It's a war. And he uses that language in here, talking about putting on the armor of God. He's, he's telling us how hard this is going to be. But it is certain. Life change is certain. God has no intention of saving you and getting you to heaven unchanged. And that is the conclusion to Paul's understanding of this wonderful gospel. We learned it in chapter four. And he says something as practical as this to a bunch of Gentiles who come from a pagan culture. And I can't even describe how pagan the culture is, but it, it reminded me a lot of my world. He simply says, don't live like your culture anymore. And here's why. Because the culture's hearts are dark and they're hard they have no understanding. They are dead. They're alienated from God and they're reckless. They hurt themselves. They can't even feel anymore. They call bad good and good bad. It's all messed up. And here's why he says for us to go and live differently, to not live out our culture, is because that isn't us anymore. It's who we used to be. But our hearts aren't dead. They're not hard. We're not calloused. We feel now. In fact, the, the way Paul describes it is we're 
We're totally brand new. Chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, he says, here's how that happened, that you've learned from Christ. You were taught by Christ. You are now been, you're new in Christ. That's, that's what took place. And I suppose that's why I said when we started that the best part of this whole story is the gospel that we shouldn't ever get tired of telling because where this starts, where your confidence comes from to know that you will be transformed in the image of Jesus is because of the good news of the gospel. Your circumstances might not lead you there. Your opportunities might not lead you there. Uh, There could be all sorts of challenges But if you have doubt about the certainty of your change, just look at the gospel. That's why he wants us to know that. It's it's possible and certain because of the finished work of Christ. Let, Let me read a short passage from the NIV which emphasizes the past tense of what is already ours in Christ to lead us to understand that this is certain. When you heard about Christ, you were taught, you were taught, past tense, in him according to the truth that is in Christ. You were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. All of it, all of the description of what is ours is already stated to have happened. And that's why we have to hang on to this. The reason why we are certain about our transformation is because our old self has already been put to death. That move the needle for anybody? There's no hope if that hasn't already happened. The gospel tells us that our mind has already been renewed. Where once it saw nothing, now it perceives truth. Once it couldn't perceive God, now it loves him and it worships him. You have already, past tense, been made new. That's the language that Paul uses. And he says, because you've been to the school of Christ. You've learned from him. You've been taught by him. You're in him. In fact, that's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. Not in the hopper to become a new creation. Not hoping to become a new creation. If you're in Christ, you're what? New. That's what he says. And the old has already, already passed away and the new has come. It is the work of God alone that saves us and changes us. Well, how could that possibly happen in a world like this? Well, here's how Paul tells us. God through Christ must destroy the old me, which he has. God through Christ must change my mind, which he has. And God through Christ must make me like Jesus. Okay, that, that is a certain spiritual position in the heavenlies for those who claim Christ. Understood? There's a second half to how we become like Jesus and how we see transformation in our life. We spend the rest of our days fighting the flesh. The unreformed, untransformed part of every believer, the body of flesh that is decaying, is at war with the Spirit of God in me, and they conflict with each other constantly. My soul wants to worship, my flesh wants to sleep. Do you understand? That's all of us. And that's the point I tried to make to you several weeks ago, that we spend our entire life putting off the sinful flinches of a dead man. If you were here, your mind, I I, I used the illustration of that rattlesnake I killed. I, I killed the rattlesnake, I cut off its head, and I looked at it, and it's still rattling. And it dawned on me, that's me. That is totally me. The old man is already dead, but what, what is the explanation for all this bad stuff? It's the rattle of the dead man. The, the flesh wants to get angry from time to time. That's the rattle of the dead man. When you want to take a second look at a girl, guys, that's the rattle of the dead man. That's not Christ in you. That is not Jesus perfecting you. That's the old you, still rattling around. When you want to hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness, it's not Christ in you, it's the rattle of the dead man. Does it make sense? You're already dead. And until glory, you fight the flesh. And you put it off. And how do you do that? It's as practical as it could possibly be. You confess your sin and you reject your sin. That's putting off. Don't call your sin something else. Don't call yourself a victim. Don't put yourself in a classification that says you don't have to deal with this. Don't put it on someone else and say it's their fault. The reason why I'm doing this is because of them. You simply say, I am the sinner and I reject my sin. That is the practical out 
work of putting off. There's nothing else to do. Claim the gospel. Believe what the gospel says in the very beginning. It's the bad news part of the gospel, that you're as bad as you can possibly fear. Just say it. There's liberty in admitting that. Putting off, and then you put on. You wear the life of Christ. It's, it's the action of replacing those old bad habits that all of us kind of were raised in with godly habits, right? That's what we do. Bad habits never end by just removal. You know, you can't just say, I'm gonna stop this. I'm just gonna stop this if you've got nothing to fill in the void. You have to replace that sin. So if there's an unrighteous way we used to walk, if there's unrighteousness in our life and we shun the unrighteousness and you just leave it void, hmm, that vortex is gonna suck something back into it. If you replace it, with the words of Christ and the worship of Christ and the brotherhood of Christ with the believers, I'm telling you, you got a better shot to defeat the flesh. And that's the only mechanism that Paul gives us in the scriptures. Reject the old stuff and put on the new stuff. Does that make sense? And in that picture, us wearing the life of Christ, we are saying every day, in everything, Jesus is our replacement. He's the replacement for lust. He's the replacement for want. He's the replacement for greed. He's the replacement for bitterness and anger. Jesus replaces all the things that trip us up. He's the replacement. And I suppose I don't know of any better picture of this Jesus replacing the bad than what we're about to do in baptism. Many people today are gonna go into the waters and going into the waters saves no one. No one's going from death to life over here. But they are telling the church the story of having come from death to life. They're telling the story of Jesus replacing their other gods, their other worship, the other wants and longings, and they're wearing Christ. They're putting off the old and putting on the new. That's the image of baptism, dead in our sins, raised to new life. You understand, right? So here's what we're going to do. It's like what we always do here. There are many people that are going to line up over here and be baptized one after another. And we're going to sing, watching them on the screen and celebrating every testimony that we see in picture form. Yeah? Let's stand together and let's worship.